Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our second Hot Topics lecture at this, on FinTech at the School of Economics and Finance. In this lecture, we're going to discuss digital currencies and dis digital payment. In a moment, I'm going to hand you over to our um, organizer, George Kudopoulos, professor at the School of Economics and Finance for some opening remarks. The structure of the event is that we will have our speaker, first speaker, Danielli, who will speak for 30 minutes and followed by you will have 10 minutes Q&A. And during that session, I would um, ask that you enter your questions into the chat section and we will then be able to answer your question. After Daniel's talk, we will have Soterius, our second speaker, give his talk and following his talk, you will have 10 minutes to ask further questions. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to George now. George. Thank you, Zafira. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. May I thank, first of all, our uh, two distinguished speakers, uh, Associate Professor Daniele Bianchi and uh, Mr. Sotiri Sirmakesis. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to say a, a couple of words summarizing their very long CVs. Uh, I would also like to thank all the attendees who are attending uh, from uh, Europe and outside Europe and UK. So this is uh, the second time we are running this uh, Hot Topics uh, lecture event. Um, we ran it for the first time last year. And the idea of this event is to bridge, uh, you know, to connect again our alumni with uh, recent advances, which are taking place in the School of Economics and Finance at Queen Mary University of London. And uh, also we try to, uh, to do this connection by uh, discussing hot topics as uh, the title of the event suggests. So last year, our first hot topic lecture was on uh, ESG. This year, it's going to be on FinTech. So uh, to this end, we have invited our two distinguished speakers. Let me first introduce uh, Associate Professor Daniela Bianchi. Daniele is Associate Professor at the School of Economics and Finance at Queen Mary University of London, and he has a rich academic career. So he has served in various places, including the University of Warwick at Bocconi University. Uh, he has visited Nova University in Lisbon, and uh, also he, he is serving apart from his uh, academic um, um, path. He's also serving as a consultant to various institutions. Uh, his expertise lies on asset pricing and uh, machine learning. Uh, so I believe that today Daniel is going to talk about uh, cryptos and uh, other related uh, material. On top of that, Daniele is uh, serving as a director of the new MSc in FinTech at the School of Economics and Finance, and he's going also to tell us a couple of words on this. Uh, before giving the floor to Daniele, may I also introduce uh, Sotiris Sirmakesis. Sotiris is a leader in financial uh, technology. Uh, he has led the digital transformation in the banking sector in uh, Greece. He has received uh, multiple awards and actually he has been named as being one of the 100 uh, top uh, Greeks in uh, fintech. Uh, so Thiris is innovation. Uh, sitting... innovation. Innovation, sorry. Uh, so Thiris is also sitting in various uh, executive boards, and uh, today he's going to to talk to us about uh, digital payments and uh, disruption. Let me give you the structure of today's event. Uh, each speaker will have thirty minutes to deliver his presentation. And then following his presentation, we're going to have a 10 minutes Q&A with you. So feel free to provide any uh, questions you may have in the Q&A uh, chat box. And uh, the speakers will very happily take your questions afterwards. So without further delay, let me pass uh, the floor to, or the screen if you like, to our first speaker, uh, Daniele, Daniele Bianchi. So, Daniele, the floor and the screen are yours. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation today. Thank you. 
Thanks, thanks, George, for the uh, very nice introduction and, and all of the participants for for being here and obviously Queen Mary for organizing the event. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm also the director of one of the new masters in uh, here in Queen Mary, so I just want to spend a couple of words before starting my presentation about this new master in finance and machine learning that we're launching at Queen Mary uh, is. Um, uh, cutting edge machine learning program, whereby the idea is to create uh, uh, professionals that can work at the intersection between uh, complex statistical methods, such as machine learning and finance. And you can tell from the compulsory core models, uh, core models that I'm highlighting here, you have everything from a surprising to introduction to uh, machine learning. So if you are interested in uh, feel free to uh, reach out and uh, eventually look at the uh, website. Now, let me share uh, my slides for the today's talk. All right. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Thanks, thanks. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, a little bit about digital currencies, uh, in particular Bitcoin. And the rationale of the talk is really try to lay out some of the uh, opportunities, but especially some of the risks that are hidden in these, let's say, new technologies that has been, you know, fast growing, certainly. So the outline of the talk uh, is the following. I'm going to talk about a little bit of Bitcoin as money, uh, a little bit of Bitcoin as an asset class, the risks for financial stabilities, and the, in particular with a focus on shadow banking to some extent, and then uh, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. As you can see, I only have questions here, question marks, not necessarily answers. And that's essentially the spirit of my presentation. I really want to throw out uh, some questions and some food for thought for uh, obviously Q&A, but also for future discussions. So um, uh, can we actually think about Bitcoin as money? Before answering this question, we uh, just want to recap briefly uh, what is money in the first place and how should we think about money uh, you know, uh, from, from the get-go. So key characteristics of money, there's nothing really new in there, you know, properties of what constitutes money has been laid out since centuries, money needs to be uh, durable, so physically stable, that do not deteriorates quickly, it needs to be transferable, so easy to transfer ownership, it needs to be divisible, so can be divided into smaller units, it needs to be scarce, or at least in limited supply, needs to be easy to verify, so recognizable, and needs to be fungible. So one unit of money can be substitute for another. So the characteristics of money are kind of clear, but when it comes to understand what is the intrinsic value of money, that's sort of a more tricky question to a large extent. Uh, what is the intrinsic value of money is an old question and um, goes back to what is you know the idea of scarcity and marginal, uh, marginal utility. and has been laid out by Adam Smith and before Adam Smith, in fact, by Plato back in the day through the so-called water diamond paradox. The idea that water is necessary for life, but it's far less expensive than diamond, which are obviously, obviously not. So the intrinsic value of money really has to deal with scarcity and marginal, uh, marginal, marginal utility. That is the reason why historically money has always been associated with commodities, in particular precious metals. In fact, we used to call commodity money. Uh, the value of commodity money was exactly underpinned by the commodity of which it was made, gold, silver, uh, and the likes. Since the last decades, and in fact, almost a century, I would say, in fact, slightly more than a century, the actual value of money has been to a large extent disconnected. Uh, with the concept of intrinsic money in the first place. And here we have the idea of um, uh, uh, fiat currencies. So fiat currencies are you know, relatively new invention, uh, certainly with respect to commodity money. And the idea is that the uh, value of fiat currencies is built upon uh, the, the, the idea of trust in central authorities, and in particular, their ability to force and at least or at least guarantee price stability and i'm going to be clear on what we mean about central authorities and what we mean by price stability uh in in in, in the next slides so um 
when it comes to trust in financial authorities and in central authorities, really the first thing that comes to mind is central banks. And in fact, central banks are uh, the, uh, let's say the key elements when it comes to fiat currencies. And original has been developed as a response to, let's say the instability in the money supply process. If you look at how the Federal Reserve has been created was, you know, before the Fed, essentially any commercial bank could, could supply money after the, after the Federal Reserve Act in the early 1900, uh, then the money supply was concentrated in the hands of the Federal Reserve. So nowadays you have a joint venture of money supply process between central bank and commercial banks. Central banks issue notes and coins and commercial banks participate to the process by issuing loans and mortgages that should have, you know, should, uh, should be backed by a certain amount of reserves that are deposited uh, at the central banks. We call the system fractional reserve currency. So the role of central banks really uh, feeds back into the idea of trust that I mentioned before. And because the role of central banks is primarily to maintain trust in the financial system. So trust in financial stability, trust in price stability, uh, uh, obviously guaranteeing liquidity is small thing. And so it's the idea of trust in this two tier system, which is key really to the very existence and, and you know, sustainability to a large extent of the whole uh, fiat currency concept. So the idea that you have independent and accountable central banks, which can supply money, not out of thin air, but uh, money is actually backed uh, by asset holdings. And to a large extent here, when it comes to, when it comes to existing uh, Bitcoin, to, to a large extent, we can think about Bitcoin as challenging to, to some extent, the very idea of trusting in central authorities and financial institutions. That's essentially the, uh, let's, let's say the general narrative, but the, the, the reality is that Bitcoin on itself uh, is not necessarily challenging the existence of financial authorities, but I see as Bitcoin uh, as in fact, a key technology, technological innovation. And I'm gonna clarify this thing in the next few slides, but before getting there, I simply want to highlight what is the actual value proposition of Bitcoin through the abstract of the white paper. Uh, that has been, you know, laid out back into 2028, and by now is almost 15 years, slightly more than 15 years. And I'm highlighting what is what I think is the key sentence, really, of the value proposition of Bitcoin, which is nothing but a peer-to-peer -peer version of of uh, payment systems, so electronic cash, which does not rely on any central authority, does not rely on any intermediary. So, if you have to summarize what is the key proposition of Bitcoin, really, is to uh, mitigate counterparty risks. So the fact that you don't need any financial intermediary for claiming transactions. This is really what is the key, uh, what is the key technology and everything that comes after it is sort of a uh, uh, corollary to, 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 to a large extent. So uh, Bitcoin to, to a large extent has been developed to, uh, to uh, kind of provide, an, uh, let's say an alternative monetary systems, which is not necessarily based on central authority. In fact, it's not based on the central authority, but the key question, the key question remains, if we can think about this technology, this financial innovation as money on, on, on itself. So key, key, key ingredients of Bitcoin is of course the existence of a protocol, which is de facto is like a legal system to a large extent. So a set of agreed rules that specify how money is supplied and how transactions are cleared uh, and is basically all based on cryptographic features that guarantees to a large extent the, uh, the immutability of transactions and uh, uh, avoiding double spending. So the fact that you can spend the same uh, um, Bitcoin or token uh, twice for two different objects. The second key ingredient is the existence of a public ledger that stores information uh, uh, of, of transactions, which is what we normally call blockchain. And the third key element is the existence of a decentralized network of participants. They really take the spot of intermediaries, instead of having a single intermediaries, you have a network of intermediaries, if you wish, um, uh, which has the core uh, task of updating the public ledgers according to the rules that are defined by the protocols. And I'm highlighting here the, the, the trustlessness of, of this whole system, the fact that you don't have third, third parties of intermediaries and de facto that uh, kind of mitigates the existence of counterparty risk. So to a large extent, Bitcoin is sort of a parallel monetary system whereby money supply is not backed by any asset. And we're gonna go to this point later on where we talk about money, uh, Bitcoin as money. 
So there is no asset holdings here, there is no intermediaries, and it's all essentially a decentralized uh, network uh, network system. So, uh, you know, having laid out the ingredients and, you know, holding all of the uh, key properties of money that we laid out before, then the main question is, can we actually think about Bitcoin as money? And let me lay out what is the main definition of money in the first place. So money needs to have essentially three key properties, uh, should be used as a medium of exchange between individuals, should be uh, used as a store of value, uh, you know, at least when you don't have double digit inflation rates, uh, and should be obviously used as a unit of account. But on top of that, there is a fourth property that is particular of your currencies, which is, is de facto liability. So money is in fact a central bank liability in the first place, which is supplied uh, 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 being backed by uh, asset holdings. Now, what about Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is not used as a medium of exchange, certainly not at the moment, is not used as a store of value, if anything, because it's highly volatile, and not being used as a unit of account, for the same reason why it's not used uh, as a medium of exchange on a large scale. And on top of that, really, what strikes me about Bitcoin is that there is no one liability. So there is no assets that are back in the supply process or the money supply process. So the main message here is that, at least for now, we can't really think about Bitcoin, not yet at least, uh, as a form of money. And the fact that it's not backed by asset holdings uh, implies that its value really depends on the expectations that Bitcoin will be used uh, in the future, right? So long story short, Bitcoin as money, maybe not yet. Certainly not, uh, uh, does not, uh, satisfy all of the properties of money that we actually think of uh, uh, nowadays. Now, that said, it's potentially a key innovation for payment system. The fact that you don't have a, a central authority, the fact that you don't have intermediaries actually makes the system relatively more robust vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, centralized systems. At least that's the value proposition of adopters and, and developers uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to Bitcoin. So it's potentially a key innovation and it's mainly value, it's main value actually is linked to the diffusion uh, and use. But okay, if it's not money, or at least not yet money, how should we think about Bitcoin? Okay, is this innovate innovative payment systems, or at least the idea of blockchain and decentralization can be thought certainly as an innovative system, but if it's not yet money, what it is? So in the next couple of slides, I try to convince you that in fact, the way the industry is moving when it comes to Bitcoin, but more generally speaking to cryptocurrency, is really thinking about Bitcoin as an asset. Uh, here's the first instance. What I'm highlighting here is an example of uh, one of out of many articles, really, um, on how you know, some banks and some financial intermediaries are actually thinking about Bitcoin more as an asset vis-a-vis -vis as money or as a method of payment. And this particular uh, example relates to Goldman Sachs that back in 2022, a little bit less than a year ago, they were trying to push this idea of using uh, uh, Bitcoin as a collateral for loans and mortgages. So think about your housing mortgage, instead of putting your house as a collateral, you put Bitcoin as a collateral, which implies the idea of Bitcoin really as a commodity or at least as property really, rather than, rather than money. This is just an example, you have many others. And what I think uh, could be interesting here for, for you know, this talk is really the fact that you know, institutional investors in particular are jumping in more and more into the crypto space and in Bitcoin in particular. I'm highlighting here, for instance, on the top left, an article that appeared on uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, about the article was essentially telling about Fidelity running a survey on 800 institutions in Euros and US and, and, and Europe. Uh, and uh, it turned out that was back 2020. It turned out that a third of big institutions actually were owning crypto assets and Bitcoin in particular, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and, and others. Um, uh, if you look at bottom left, was Fidelity starting to propose Bitcoin for retirees? In fact, Bitcoin as your 401k retirement investment. So there is this uh, increasing narrative, at least in the institutional investor landscape, they try to push the idea of crypto more as an asset rather than uh, a method of payment. And obviously uh, after that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there has been an increased number of, uh, of, of uh, token that has been developed, token and coins, 
Uh, Bitcoin really is the catalyst, which is the reason why I actually focus most on Bitcoin uh, um, in, in this talk. But there are more than 19,000. In fact, nowadays, more than 20,000 of tokens and coins with vi variety of characteristics, which I'm not really going to um, uh, much in details. Now, the reality is, is that Bitcoin remains the, the biggest player with almost 40% of the total market uh, capitalization. But the main idea of why you see more and more institutional investors coming into the marketplace really has to deal with the fact that we, at least until a few months ago, we were living in a so-called low yield environment, in particular for FX and, 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 and fixed income. So the search for yield, as I'm quoting here, uh, essentially spurred an increase in capital flow into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency markets. Let me clarify a bit what do I mean by capital flows though. What I'm highlighting here is a report by CoinShare, which is a company that uh, compiles data for institutional investors that specialize in, in, in cryptocurrencies. And essentially this picture shows the asset under management in mutual funds or exchange traded product, which is these ETP um, uh, uh, shortcut. So it's essentially the asset under, uh, asset under management of essentially the whole industry that specialized in, in cryptocurrency, which went from essentially nothing in 27 to uh, almost 50 billion US dollars uh, at the moment, which is still a tiny fraction of what you think about, you know, asset under management in the equity space, which is you know, trillions of US dollars, but it's growing and it's growing at a very fast pace. Um, it's not just a, a local phenomena, but it's actually a global phenomena. So what I'm reporting here is a snapshot of a research paper that I have uh, with one of my co-authors, has been recently published on the general banking and finance, where we actually look at the performance of cryptocurrency funds and we collect the data on geographical provenience and regulatory framework of a variety of funds that specialize in crypto assets. And then you can see, if you look at, for instance, in the panel on the left, you see that obviously the vast majority of funds actually are residential in the US, but the, the phenomenon is really global. So you see that funds are essentially spread out uh, everywhere. And when it comes to regulation, the vast majority of them is not SEC regulated, which means it does not comply, uh, or at least is not subject to the SEC regulatory framework. So it's relatively widespread, increasing, and certainly under-regulated uh, uh, investment landscape. So I said that, okay, we can't think about really Bitcoin as money, not yet. We can, perhaps the industry seems to think about Bitcoin really as an asset. And in fact, that's what the data tell me uh, in terms of you know, intensive margin and extensive margin on investments. But the, the, the reality is that Bitcoin and in fact, all of the cryptocurrencies are, are highly risk investments. So what I'm highlighting here, for instance, is the price drawdown from all time high for Bitcoin essentially since 2011. And as you can see, it's not uncommon to have a drawdown of more than 80%, which is staggering by any metrics for any type of investments. And here, when it comes to the idea of risk vis-a-vis -vis opportunities, we can think about Bitcoin obviously and all cryptocurrencies to a large extent uh, as, as financial innovation, but the reality is that from the point of view of the regulator, they represents a risk. And obviously that's not, news in, in a sense. What I'm highlighting here, for instance, was an article that appeared on Reuters in June 2022, whereby the Bank of International Settlement, precisely because there was such an increasing interest from institutional investors on such a risky asset class, they were kind of screaming uh, the uh, fears on uh, the mater materializations of, of, of risks, not only for institutional investors, obviously, but also for, but also for um, let's say, households. So uh, it's not money, uh, could be an asset class, but a very risky one. So now what I try to address next is, okay, what kind of risks we have for financial stability? And to me, the natural starting point is commercial banks. Not only because, as I said at the very beginning, they uh, represent a key component in the money supply process because of joint venture with, with, with central banks, but also because where you know most of the uh, most of the money are actually deposited, you know, household money are actually deposited. So uh, commercial banks provide a natural starting point, um, and that's essentially where the regulatory framework uh, comes in. Uh, and the idea is try to understand what is the exposure of commercial banks through direct or indirect linkages 
to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And when I talk about uh, direct and indirect linkages, I mean things as such as intermediation services, custodian services, market clearing services, or underwriting, for instance, for financing uh, so-called initial coin offering, which is the initial public offering counterpart within the cryptocurrency space. So what I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides uh, related to financial stability risk is a survey that has been compiled by the uh, uh, Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which is part of the, uh, uh, let's say the overarching regulatory system on, on the banking sector. And what they, what they normally do or what they decided to do since 2010, 2020 was to monitor the exposure of major banks to cryptocurrency markets. They cover 20, 26 jurisdictions that participate in these monitoring exercises. And at the end, they start with 178 banks, of which 112 are the, in the so-called group one or tier one banks. So uh, 27 of those systematically important for the uh, euro area and 60, 66 group two banks. So banks that are less relevant from a systemic risk uh, perspective. The results that I'm gonna show you are related to quarter four of 2020. And uh, the reason is that, uh, oops. The reason is that we don't actually have any other data beyond them. Um, so it's relatively outdated, but it's as good as it gets from the BIS uh, and the Bank of uh, the, the Basel Committee uh, supervision exercise. So I'm highlighting here a bunch of graphs. Uh, the the, uh, the let, let's say the executive summary of this graph is that if you look at banks with exposure to cryptos, which is here on the left, you get seven banks that openly declare that are exposed to cryptos. Um, and uh, when it comes to the sites of the survey banks, uh, they are essentially, uh, uh, let's say smaller vis-a-vis -vis those that are not directly exposed to crypto. When it comes to the exposures, is essentially through trading client accounts. So they trade on behalf of clients. They provide also cleaning, uh, cleaning, uh, uh, market cleaning services when it comes to futures contracts. Uh, and they provide to a, a lower extent, they provide custody and services. And under other interesting is essentially consulting services. So not direct exposure, but let's say interest in, in the cryptocurrency space. So the, the, the summary of the BIS survey, at least as quarter four of 2020, was that uh, the exposure, at least the direct exposure of commercial banks in the cryptocurrency space, and Bitcoin in particular, was relatively low. In fact, the amount of direct exposure totaled uh, 188 million US dollars, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the total amount of deposits and, and you know, assets and liabilities that normally uh, relates to these 178 banks. The bank exposure was primarily cli client-related activities. So as I said, custodian services, uh, trading on behalf of clients and so on and so forth, not direct investments uh, in the first place. Now, you might argue that, okay, you are kind of, uh, you know, kind of overplaying or over, overthinking really the risks of for financial stabilities when it comes to cryptocurrencies, but that's not necessarily the full picture. In fact, there are, let's say, two new type of players that in fact uh, can, can make the vast majority of uh, of can contain the mass majority of risks when it comes to cryptocurrency. One of those is cryptocurrency exchanges and the second type of player is so-called decentralized finance system uh, and stable coins, which is a very important part of it. So let me walk you through cryptocurrency exchanges first and what kind of risks we are talking about and decentralized finance second and what kind of risks we are talking about. And when I talk about decentralized finance, I try to make the idea of kind of a mapping between shadow banking system vis-a-vis -vis decentralized finance. So uh, we saw that there is a relatively limited involvement of banks and I talked about cryptocurrency exchanges. Let me clarify what do we mean by cryptocurrency exchanges. We can make a, uh, essentially a main distinction between centralized and decentralized exchanges. Centralized exchanges are essentially, you know, every other equity exchange you do deal with. So it's a private entity which is run by a third party and essentially provides the infrastructure to train against other market participants. And so it's nothing really new there. The only difference is that you know you, you can trade cryptos vis-a-vis -vis Tesla and, and Apple stocks. The real novelty comes from uh, decentralized exchanges that 
which are not operated by any central authority. They are run based on a system of smart contracts, so completely decentralized system. There is no centralized oversight. And for that reason, you are free of KYC, so know your customer obligations, so to speak, or custodian regulation in the first place. So it's uh, essentially centralized versus decentralized, so central authority versus network. Uh, uh, and that's what makes the most differentiation between the two types of exchanges. So I'm lay out some of the differences if you are interested in uh, just you know, for completeness. Uh, the reality is that, at, at the, you know, as we speak, the amount of trading that takes place on decentralized exchanges is a tiny fraction compared to the total. Part of the reason is because they are essentially more costly. You have high slippages, so you have essentially higher trading costs and much lower liquidity that you would get on centralized exchanges. That makes uh, a whole of a difference, uh, a hell of a difference for who actually needs to put, uh, 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 you know, trading orders. So decentralized exchanges are still uh, much less used compared to centralized exchanges. Now, nevertheless, if you look at centralized exchanges, what I'm showing you here is the Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin in units, not in US dollars, but, you know, number of coins that are held at centralized exchanges for a variety of centralized exchanges that you see on the, le on the legend. So, as you can see, the amount of, amount of capital, really, that is deposited, really, we're talking about here as, as holding deposits, in centralized exchanges in massively increase since 2020, 2018, and it actually makes US dollars a non-trivial fraction of a non-trivial uh, amount of capital, really. Now, the things you have to consider here is that Bitcoin uh, centralized exchanges doesn't really enjoy, uh, um, uh, doesn't, oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. The, the things that we have to uh, consider here is that uh, centralized exchanges do not enjoy any backstop uh, guarantee by any central authority. So the capital that you see here can be lost overnight, really. And this is something that actually happened uh, 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 in the context of FTX, um, which is you know, one of the most famous collapses that have happened within the cryptocurrency space was a centralized exchange. In fact, it's the second largest centralized exchange and essentially collapsed overnight. They froze all of the withdrawals and essentially if you had the money there, uh, the money would, would get lost and there is no actually way you could, you could uh, take that money back. So uh, centralized exchanges actually represents uh, an element of fragility that is essentially going to be under the radar from a regulatory perspective, but actually involves quite a large amount of capital um, 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 that could actually spill over into the real economy. So the, 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 the key message here is that uh, the risks for financial stability could be real when it comes to centralized exchanges. And as such, uh, would probably not go a bad idea, uh, not be a bad idea to strengthen liquidity or at least loss absorbing capacity. And, it certainly increase the regular oversight when it comes to centralized centralized exchanges, precisely because you have all of the elements of risks that you normally have in any financial intermediary institution. So it's all in the hands of a single entity. And if the single entity doesn't behave, uh, uh, then, uh, and you don't have a backstop guarantee by any other government authorities, then it's easy that you can lose your money uh, without any chance to recovering them. Now, I mentioned before uh, the, the, the comparison between decentralized uh, finance and, and uh, shadow banking. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to lay out that comparison a bit more formally. And uh, you, you, you should see the next couple of slides really uh, in, in conjunction with what I mentioned before about centralized exchanges. So centralized exchanges are essentially deposits institutions for at least from the point of view of, 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 of a trading perspective or households or individual traders, and in fact, even large traders, which is at risk because you don't have a backstop guarantee. But the very same argument can be done for decentralized, decentralized finance. And I try to make that argument by making a comparison with shadow banking. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what is shadow banking, bank, shadow banking essentially is bank-like activities, which is mainly borrowing and lending, that normally take place outside the traditional banking sector and outside the usual regulatory oversight. And 
Uh, this is commonly referred to internationally as non-bank financial intermediations. There are lots of examples in traditional finance. Two main examples are money market funds and euro dollars market. Those are de facto, and in fact, um, a, a reason of worry back in the financial crisis in 28, 29, those are de facto shadow banking uh, systems. Um, and shadow banking is kind of anathema to a large extent for regulators because was one of the primary reasons why the financial crisis in 28 were to some extent were getting out of control because lending and borrowing was essentially no longer uh, controlled by central bank reserves and there was completely decoupling between the amount of money that was borrowed and lent and the money supply. So um, the, 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 the idea of thinking about DeFi as a shadow banking uh, uh, system is, you know, is growing, in particular is growing in some media outlets and in, in financial regulatory circles. And what I'm highlighting what I'm highlighting here is an article that appeared on Bloomberg in March 2022 that were precisely making this comparison. Cryptos are regulated DeFi boom rises, shadow banking comparisons. So the idea that you can actually think about all of the risks that characterize shadow banking as the risks that are underlying cryptocurrencies and, and, and Bitcoin, at least using within the context of asset classes, which is what I showed you, uh, what I showed you before. So example of decentralized finance, decentralized finance, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is essentially a, a collective term for a variety of financial products and services that are accessible by anyone uh, on decentralized systems. Examples are stable coins, uh, pegged and non-pegged, so algorithmic stable coins or, fee or pegged to fiat currencies, taking services, services, which is essentially saving the account or borrowing and lending. For instance, I give an example here of borrowing and lending, uh, this is, uh, for instance, the interest rate that you can get if you put as a collateral. On the left, you see DAI, which is an algorithmic stablecoin. On the right, you see USDC, which is a fiat currency pegged stablecoins. And all the interest rates that you see here is essentially the rate that you can get by lending uh, 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 DAI using as a collateral a variety of other cryptocurrencies and the data sources here on the bottom left. So it's essentially really the borrowing and lending market, which is completely detached from any regulatory oversight and it's completely detached from any control by any central bank. Uh, just to give an idea of the order of magnitude of uh, all of the collateral, so to speak, that are put in place to, uh, um, you know, to the whole DeFi ecosystem, which is the reason why there is an increasing, let's say, worry from a regulatory perspective on the, 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 you know, the importance of the shadow financial system. What I'm reporting here is the total value locked in US dollars in all of the decentralized finance applications. And this is obviously in US dollars. So you see that at the peak, let's say of the bubble, at the end of 2021, there were more than 150, 150 billion US dollars put as a collateral for the actual, the very functioning of the decentralized finance ecosystem. So the money that is involved is not, obviously, it's an order of magnitude smaller than any other financial class you can think of, but is, is actually non-trivial. And in fact, you could see that when it comes to the risks for those who are involved in the type of activity, oops, you see that the, from the peak of the bubble at the end of 2021, there has been a significant crash, a significant loss of capital. In fact, almost two thirds of the capital that was put, uh, was put as a collateral in the DeFi platform got lost with all of the consequences in terms of spillovers for households and, and institutional investors. So um, I mentioned before uh, for cryptocurrency exchanges, reasons of concerns are you lose your money as a, as a individual investors because there is no backstop guarantee and those are de facto deposit. When it comes to DeFi, the uh, uh, reasons of concerns could be possibly three. Excessive leverage, so the fact that you can have an unconstrained supply of financial assets. I showed you the example before of borrowing and lending, uh, which de facto uh, uh, incentivizes the uh, uh, asset bubbles, uh, um, um, let's say production. A second reason of concern is obviously contagion because uh, you can you can figure it out. I made the example before uh, showing the uh, initiative of Goldman Sachs of using Bitcoin as a collateral for a mortgage. That's like a key example or a case in point in which you might have a spillover between real economy 
and uh, 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 cryptos. <clears throat> and then third, uh, last but not least, is uh, the risk of bank runs. The fact that uh, you don't have any, essentially any governmental guarantee or any deposits and any collateralizations makes uh, kind of likely that in a situations where redemption and collateralization becomes very risky, makes very likely investors simply run away. So uh, you have a bank run uh, situation. So all of those are possible reasons of concerns when it comes to DeFi. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is lots of financial innovation that could be worth it, but I, you know, as of now, there are a certain amount of risks which are going under the radar from a regulatory oversight perspective, which needs to be uh, at least considered carefully. So I'm um, uh, right on time, uh, which is unusual for me. So that's, that's good news. So I just want to leave you with a couple of, uh, let's say, food for thoughts. Um, what, what I try to push here is the idea that, in fact, cryptos, Bitcoin, obviously not all of cryptos, uh, but certainly some of them represent, or they could represent the key financial innovations, in particular when it comes to payments, trading, in fact, uh, robustness of the financial systems uh, and financial intermediation in the first place. But there needs to be a few things that need, that, you know, a few pillars of the discussion that needs to be central in the near future. First of all, try to understand what is the risks of spillovers between, let's say, traditional financial markets and cryptocurrency markets. We need to have a proactive and perhaps forward-looking regulatory approach, which does not necessarily have to be too much intrusive, but certainly try to, uh, uh, try to understand what is the future trajectory of this type of technologies and try to anticipate eventual sources of risks. The risk that you have, which is the third point that I have here, is that you have obviously corporate and political capturing of the regulatory framework, uh, which does not necessarily keep pace with the market development. And last but not least, at least as a researcher, that's something that I really wants to really wants to see developed is the availability of transparent data, not just data on transactions, because there's a, these are these are on, on the blockchain and readily available to anyone, but data on the risk exposure of, of, of intermediaries and, and commercial banks and, and, and traditional financial players on the cryptocurrency space, because those are, they're essentially, date, those data are not existent. So we don't really know what is the exposure of households, what is the exposure of, of uh, you know, traditional financial players in the cryptocurrency space. We have snapshot that pertains given periods, they're certainly outdated, but we don't really have uh, uh, updated data on, on, on these aspects, which is which is really key. So I'm, I'm leaving you there and hopefully there was some interesting insight. Thank you very much, Thanks. Daniela, for your insightful uh, presentation. I think we have uh, some time to take a few questions and actually I see that the Three questions already in, in the Q and A chat box. So the first question, I, mean, I don't know, can, can you read them or would you like? Yes, to... I can. Should okay. I reply? Sure. Uh, so does anyone read it, or I'm the only one? Should I repeat the questions, or uh, the attendants can read the questions themselves? Feel, feel free to repeat it. Uh, just ah, okay. So. Uh, I got three questions. One asks, what is the plausible impact of domino downfall in crypto market that has been started by FTX? This is a good question uh, and goes back to the fact that we don't really have much data on what is the exposure and what is the, let's say, the, the systemic risk of institutions within the cryptocurrency space and spillovers in you know, more traditional financial intermediaries. It's hard to say because we don't have the data. Uh, Certainly, uh, being the second largest uh, centralized exchange uh, certainly has been a major impact. Uh, the thing that surprised me personally is how resilient is, in fact, the full ecosystem, because, as I said, there is essentially no government guarantee here. So uh, the fact that, you know, the entire system didn't collapse, despite the fact that one of the major players indeed collapsed overnight is sort of, a, I take that as a sort of a positive, a positive news. But the reality is that it's difficult to say what could be any domino uh, downfall effect in the, in, the, in the near future. There has been a lot of discount already, uh, domino effect, but uh, it's hard to say. Then there is a second question on what are your views about the digital currencies issued by central banks, such as China and India? I, I, I'm not 
I haven't talked about CBDC, so central bank digital currencies, because there was not much time, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but um, yeah, certainly uh, the, 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 there are varieties of implications when it comes to monetary policy and financial stability when it comes to CBDC. Um, so I, I really don't have any particular personal view on, on, on uh, CBDC in the first place. So there's another question. Uh, I'm an MC student in AI here at Quimeri. What are your thoughts on the behavior of Bitcoin this year? Well, I, I can't give any 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 forecast. It's 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 very hard to, and it's not really my job in the first place. So I I I, I can't give you you know um, uh, any any prediction uh, on Bitcoin, unfortunately. And then we have another question. Do CBDC provide a solution to the risk posed by crypto? This is an interesting question. Uh, uh, I, it's something that I you know, we really need to think about. Uh, I, I guess it boils down to the fact that if we, if we believe that crypto and CBDC are competitors or you know, they, they, they exist for different reasons, uh, so uh, I, I honestly can tell, I, I don't know. Uh, if CBDC can 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 mitigate sources of risks that we currently have in the in the in the cryptocurrency space, I'm leaning towards to say no, because un unless you fix all of the you know all of the fragility of the systems when it comes to centralized exchanges, was when it comes to the shadow financial system feature of, of DeFi, unless you fix those fragility in the first place, CBDC doesn't really do anything to fix those fragilities simply provide like a, like a centralized government approved uh, way to, 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 to use digital, 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 digital currencies, but it's not necessarily fix those fragilities. Uh, the last question in the current framework, how do you check for any fraudulent activities? Uh, that's, that's a, not a very good question. Unfortunately, you know, this, is, this is an ecosystem that is flagged by Frauds and is one of the main reasons of, of concern from for regulators, in particular, when it comes to households, not necessarily institutional investors, but certainly for households. Uh, the, 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 the regulator is moving towards a, towards a more proactive approach when it comes to prevent fraudulent activities and protect households. Certainly, when it comes to licensing uh, products, um, um, here in particular in the UK, the FCA is relatively, uh, you know, um, by now is relatively more proactive than it used to be a, a couple, of, couple of years ago, but certainly the, 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 the prevention of fraud and, and fraudulent activity is one of the key aspects at the end uh, of certainly protecting, uh, protecting, protecting households. And it's not necessarily contradicting with the developing of the ecosystem in the first place. The two things can really coexist. Really depends on what type of regulatory approach you want to think, you want to take. If it's intrusive and try to contain the phenomenon or, or is proactive and try to develop the phenomenon, uh, then it could be different uh, regulatory approach. And it's not, at least to me, it's not necessarily clear where we are heading, uh, because uh, you know there are certain regulatory jurisdictions that are more leaning towards contain the cryptocurrency phenomena to avoid that money supply gets out of control. Um, there are certain other uh, uh, jurisdictions that are taking a more proactive approach and see really see uh, cryptos as as a, as a you know source of financial innovation. Um, you know, time will tell which one which one prevails. Okay, I have a last question maybe I could take. Digital currencies are more, uh, are more prone to speculation versus currencies backed by central banks and a lot of the growth has been driven by pyramid scheme like marketing. Do you think this is a long-term weakness? Uh, I mean, as I just said, really boils down how the regulatory framework will develop. Uh, I mean, I've been dealing with this space since, since a few years by now and I could tell that things massively improve we went essentially from the Wild West to something that resemble, um, start to resemble like a financial financial infrastructure or financial system. So things could be, could improve, certainly will improve. And uh, it, it boils down to how uh, robust is the overall system. But, you know, let's see, let's see how things will develop.
Okay, thank you so much, Daniel, uh, for taking thank these you, questions. George. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation once again. Thank you. And many thanks to the audience for uh, providing these uh, very stimulating questions to our speaker. So I think now we can move to our second speaker, to Sotiris Irmakesis. So Sotiris, the platform is yours. Okay, thank you very much, George. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, both George and uh, Queen Mary University for this opportunity. I'd like to thank all the participants for being here. Uh, I will ask you to brace yourselves because it's going to be uh, 30 minutes of 100 slides almost. So let's start. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a brand new company called Through Payments Europe. Uh, my background started back in the 90s, early 90s, where uh, in uh, banking Greece I introduced the first uh, internet banking and uh, online cards acquiring platform. My major achievement, I suppose, it was in Piraeus Bank when we created WinBank, which is uh, the most successful digital banking platform both in Greece and Southeastern Europe. Then I moved to Eurobank to run a bank-wide digital transformation program, and then to Praxia Bank, which uh, aspired to be the first pure, purely digital bank in Greece, but uh, did, this didn't work out. So eventually I decided to start something on my own, which is through aiming to disrupt the card payments uh, and marketing platforms in uh, Europe and the rest of the world. Of course, in the past, I have uh, served as a board member in several uh, private and listed companies, both in Greece and abroad, and also served uh, uh, as an advisor in several other companies. So this presentation is in four parts. We start with technology in general, then we move to alternative payment methods and how they compare to card payments, uh, the opportunity for alternative payment methods today, and uh, what the status is all over the world and why this is a little threatening for traditional players like Visa, MasterCard, American Express and so on. So starting with technology, if we look uh, six, seven years uh, back, we will see that uh, as things evoluted, all of the companies, all of the top companies in, uh, uh, by market capitalization were technology companies. But what's more interesting is that if we look five years later, we'll see that not only they maintain their positions more or less, but they hugely increased their market caps uh, as they grew their business uh, over time. Now, people adapt technology faster than ever, and this we can see for uh, Skype, Twitter, and Gmail, how fast they grew their audiences. Facebook later, WhatsApp, even more abrupt uh, increase later, but in financial services as well, Alipay took only four years to onboard 250 million people. But what's even more uh, exciting and impressive is the, the fact that ChatGPT, in just five days, they managed to onboard uh, one million users. And I think it is five million users in the first month. Uh, so Alipay um, have uh, onboarded but in only seven years almost 700 million people and as we, we will see later Alipay and WeChat Pay in China are the only practically only methods uh, that Chinese people use to pay. So things are moving extremely fast and this is impressive and this is also exciting as we, th as we see things uh, changing over time. The competition uh, field is also very different. So while Mercedes, for example, was uh, competing with Lexus and BM in the past, now they have to also compete to Tesla and Uber and Google. While Walmart were competing with Target and Costco, now they have Amazon and Alibaba as the competitors. Traditional media companies, now they fight with uh, digital players like Netflix and YouTube. And in our sector, financial behemoths like uh, the card organization, City, and so on. Now they have as competitors PayPal, Stripe, Affirm, Adyen, and uh, other companies that are more or less well known, but not necessarily to everybody. But their market caps and their valuations in general are huge. So things are moving uh, gradually and then suddenly. So if we see wh what happened when Apple launched uh, the iPhone, the stock price of this company gradually 
started to fall and then suddenly went to zero. Which company is this? BlackBerry. And uh, the owner of BlackBerry used to say that he's still the leader of the pack, that uh, the profit surge, they would, they would not see any competition and so on. They would not see uh, another player, Blockbuster, that uh, Netflix were to become the company that would actually take them out of market. And this is exactly what happened when Netflix started to become digital at all. So we have new business models based on technology to emerge. Uh, and we know how Netflix and Spotify changed the movies and music industries, meta the media industry, Airbnb, Uber, Walt, and so on how they introduced new models by utilizing technology in the appropriate way. But apart from those big players, we have a lot of smaller players that have become unicorns, the ones on the left, plus a series of others that they, they used not to be unicorns. Some of them are already unicorns as well. So all of them present a new kind of threat to large uh, established players. And sometimes what happens is uh, what we call uh, death by a thousand bytes because they seem to be smaller than the huge ones but there but there are a lot there are many so if we see the rank of uh, companies in the fortune 500 uh, between 2000 and 2015 we will see that technology companies have moved up uh, the ladder, and there are companies that went down there are companies that uh, disappeared like motorola bought by google and then kodak that uh, was was actually uh, bankrupt, went actually bankrupt, while it was in a very good position back in 2000. And this is because Kodak, they uh, refused to adapt digital when the time was there, although comp uh, Kodak was the company that first invented the digital cameras, but they wanted to defend their traditional business like films, papers, and so on. Of course, we don't know what will happen in the future. So in 15 years from now, what companies uh, will be there in the Fortune 500 uh, top 10. So let's move to payments and financial services. If we move to payments, what we will see is that when people pay with cards and when a consumer pays a merchant, then there is an acquirer that takes the card data, moves them over to a card scheme. They send, it, they send them over to, it, to an issuer. The issuer rejects or confirms the transaction the response goes back to merchant and this is a transaction that has gone all over the world. Of course, each player that uh, is uh, taking place in this web uh, has its own cost. They introduce their own revenues. All this revenue is bared by the merchant. And if we add Apple Pay, who, add, uh, who adds, that adds an, an additional cost, which is paid by the card issuer. And if we add other players like WhatsApp and Viber, who also introduce payments, then we will see that this cost also uh, that, that this cost rises even more. This is why merchants go against uh, Mastercard and Visa. This is very very recent, as you can see, uh, February twentieth, uh, with uh, class actions to ask uh, for to, to claim huge compensations uh, at uh, seven point five billion pounds in this case. And this has happened many times uh, during the last thirty years. Uh, there was a moment when Amazon threatened Visa to ban their cards in the UK. Uh, a few months later, they settled uh, and uh, they still accept cards, but this is a very good sign. While when some people, when people pay with uh, cards, they have to go through the so-called strong customer authentication process. And this is because of the payment services directive to in Europe, which is also uh, valid for UK right now. And when people do this, then 29% of these uh, authentication attempts fail. And this is potential lost revenue for the merchants. And this applies to a huge market because in uh, Europe, out of the 3.7 trillion of payments in the retail sector, 2.7 trillion is paid by cards. And this leads to a cost of more than 26 billion uh, euros for European merchants on an annual basis and also increased 10% year on year. In some countries like Greece, Romania, and so on, that are lagging behind the European average, this increase is not 10, it's, it's about 20 to 25% year on year. So the uh, merchants uh, face the problem of massive cost because of commissions, equipment, fraud, uh, and so on. 
they miss the opportunity to market their services uh, properly to their customers. And this is because uh, the payment platforms that they use are not linked to the actual purchasing process. So they don't participate in loyalty systems, except for the large ones. Uh, the smaller ones do not use digital platforms. They use old school loyalty systems based on cards, based on papers and so on. And of course, they cannot uh, really uh, use digital tools while uh, they are willing to pay uh, to sell in order to, to, in order to increase their sales. And this is proven by the fact that they participate in marketplaces where they pay huge commissions. And on the other side, we have consumers who uh, don't get something back every time they pay, except if they pay with credit cards. Their loyalty offerings are fragmented, they are not digital, and when they pay online, they're insecure, they are frustrated because they have to, uh, to, to share personal financial data with third parties, and so on. So, the solution is to minimize cost by taking out all those players that increase cost for the merchants and replace, actually, the card and the POS with mobile phones, which are already in the hands of both consumers and merchants. In order for this to happen, we need closed-loop payment platforms. In this presentation, we will call the solution way to pay This is not existing in the market, uh, but it's just a name. With way to pay a merchant will minimize the cost, uh, and this is going to be the only revenue that way to pay will make. Now, we have merchants and consumers cooperating, and in the case of the traditional method, the cost is huge for the merchant because the issuer has to make money, the card scheme has to make money, while in the case of way to pay, in the case of a closed-loop payment platform, all the cost goes directly to the, to the payment platform, so it can be minimal, for example, up to 0.5%, while in the United States, for example, PayPal charges something like 4.3%, which is extremely huge. So the solution is to give merchants uh, the lowest cost ever, an integrated marketing platform, streamlined operations, an enriched experience to their own customers, and on the other side, at the same time, give consumers new financial benefits so that they get something every time they pay, for example, cashback, a superb experience through the mobile phone, and of course, ultimate security because they don't have usernames and passwords, they don't have card numbers to share, so they cannot be let's say, dragged to bogus websites to give their own uh, credentials and so on. And on the other side, if you look at it, you will see that there is really no need for plastics and uh, POS devices. Uh, cards were retrofitted for e-commerce, so that's why we have all those issues. Uh, we have uh, fraud-prone platforms. While on the other side, if you look at digital platforms, they're based on smartphones, they're based on QR codes, they're digital by nature, they don't have any fraud, and through open banking, one can connect all the accounts that they have in any bank all over Europe, while what does debit card give you? Access to one bank, one account, and that's it. Plus a series of other uh, benefits. So practically, we don't need cards. So as long as we have uh, uh, merchants accepting alternative payment methods, we don't need to use cards uh, anymore. How do they work? So it's a closed loop, so both consumers and merchants have to onboard the platform. Consumers use the mobile phone with a wallet inside it to pay merchants, and merchants can utilize this digital platform to return value-adding services to the consumers in order to have them uh, come back and uh, purchase more. Of course, consumers can send money to each other, and merchants can manage uh, all the payments online. A consumer on board the platform in several ways. Uh, sometimes they have to go through, uh, through a normal KYC, know your customer process. Sometimes they're not, depending on the jurisdiction where the payment platform is. If it's a uh, UK, US, uh, Lithuania or uh, Greece, it's different. Merchants uh, are also onboarded and are ready to accept payments in many ways through mobile phones, QR code stickers online and so on. Uh, in order to load, uh, to top up the wallet, uh, the best way to use is uh, open banking and what is called payment initiation because while you are inside the application, you can use the APIs of all banks in order to debit your account in a bank and bring the money over to your wallet and uh, continue spending through the wallet. How is the payment done? The payment is done by having the merchant present a QR code to the consumer 
the consumer picks up the phone, opens the camera, scans the QR code, is transferred with a deep link, as it is called, inside the application. They see all payment details, they see cashback that they will receive, they see the, the cashback that they have received in the past in order to activate and reduce the payment amount. They confirm and both parties are notified about the success of the transaction. So, in three in simple steps, a consumer can perform a payment both in the physical world and online. And just to see a few examples, online, a QR code is presented on screen and after the payment, the shop presents the success page. In a small merchant, what happens in a mobile e shop, excuse me, what happens is that we press the button for the payment and we skip scanning the QR code. We only uh, see the payment details, we confirm, and then we go back to the e shop to see that the payment is done. When we shop at a small merchant, they can use, uh, the merchants can use uh, the, th the way to pay POS application. They enter the amount, a QR code is displayed, and after the consumer pays, the merchant is notified on their mobile phones that the payment is done. In a retail outlet, where we cannot use uh, mobile phones because uh, the cashiers, uh, the tellers are a lot, we can use QR code stickers and with an integration similar to the one that we do with the online shop, a payment can be done in a very, very easy way by just scanning the printed QR code. And there are other cases, like for example, in a POS terminal, a QR code will be presented and the merchant will see on the screen that the payment is done through a printed receipt. For example, again, the payment can be done by scanning the QR code. This is valid for Greece, not necessarily for other markets. And the merchant will be notified by a notification. And finally, we can pay an individual, uh, for example, a street artist, a waiter, a delivery person, and so on, by scanning a static QR code. And in this case, we enter the amount and we give the tip to the individual who gets a notification and is uh, notified that they are paid, they have got paid. And of course, we can easily send money to people that we have in our contacts by just entering the amount and executing the transaction, as we do with several other uh, wallets. The opportunity is huge because we have a, a form here. We have customer demand, technology evolution, low barriers of entry and uh, VC funding, the, la the latter not so much uh, a year later, after the end of 2021. And of course, we had the pandemic that pushed things uh, hugely. Customer demand means that we have a lot of young people, millennials and Generation Z, who are born in, in, in the internet, let's say. They are used to use all kinds of digital media. And they are used to have experiences like the ones given by Spotify, Uber, delivery applications, Netflix, and so on. Uh, then we have technology and we saw in the beginning how it is. So we have a, a huge increase in processing power uh, today and it keeps increasing. And this is what makes several applications available, starting from uh, the humble smartphone, which is actually a supercomputer in our pockets, up to artificial intelligence, chat GPT and whatever will follow, which could, would not be here if technology had not done uh, this uh, unbelievable increase uh, from the 80s until today. And then we have barriers of entry. We saw open banking, what it means. It gives, it gives uh, people like us in, uh, through and uh, other fintechs the opportunity to utilize the existing financial services, services infrastructure to build new services and provide value adding stuff uh, to banks customers who eventually will become uh, customers of the fintechs. And finally, we have fintech uh, having a uh, the first place in investments by venture capital firms. And out of uh, all the investments in fintech, payments are number one, uh, having a huge uh, share out of all the investment amounts. And finally, we had the pandemic, which uh, pushed uh, all kinds of digital interactions, including uh, mobile payments. Now, if we look what is happening all over the world, we will see that actually there is a paradigm shift. In China, people spend only with Alipay and WeChat. All, all other payment methods are far behind. In India, we have hundreds of millions of people paying with the UPI national standard using uh, applications like Paytm, PhonePay, Bharatpay, and so on. 
while in Southeastern Asia in general, it's not only that each country runs its own QR code based uh, platform, it's also the fact that countries are cooperating between them so that they have cross-border transactions based on QR codes. And we have seen that Thailand and Malaysia, for example, uh, has done it, Thailand and Vietnam, Philippines and uh, Indonesia and Singapore and so on. In USA, we have some efforts by Venmo, which has been acquired by uh, PayPal, which uh, younger people love, Zelle, which is an interbanking uh, thing, uh, Japan, lots of uh, uh, payment methods, while PIX, introduced by the Central Bank of Brazil in Latin America, makes a huge success with tens of millions of Brazilians uh, onboarded and with a move to other countries like Colombia and Mexico. Uh, Asia, of course, leads this cashless uh, revolution uh, compared to all, kind, to all other continents. We have China where all people use either one or both of the digital wallets uh, over there. Japan with a lot of uh, payment methods based on account-to-account uh, -account, uh, payments. And if we move to our Europe, then we see that we have several uh, occurrences of account-to-account -account payment platforms based usually on QR codes. So there is one in each country. There are some that are very, very successful, like Blick, for example, in Poland, like Swiss in Sweden. But I would focus more on Lydia and Satispay in France and Italy, respectively. Uh, both are unicorns and uh, Satispay, for example, which has a similar uh, uh, business model like the one that I showed you before. They are a unicorn and they have 3 million consumers as users and about 250,000 shops that accept the method. In Europe, a few years ago, in 2020, there was the European Payments Initiative. I say it was, but it still is there. Uh, this uh, this uh, initiative aimed to create a new platform uh, where people would, able, would be able to bypass the Visa and MasterCard and make payments uh, by using their mobile phones. Uh, it was very optimistic. It was very ambitious. Uh, it was built by 16 of uh, the largest banking institutions in Europe. Uh, at the moment, they moved to up to 31 with uh, new members, but then they left and now there are only 13 and they have uh, forgotten about the European card scheme, about mobile payments and so on. So uh, it, it shows that such initiatives are better to be run by independent players than the traditional ones. So uh, in order for me to complete, to conclude, this Kodak moment is imminent for traditional players, be it banks, be it huge uh, organizations. And as we saw before with Blockbuster, with BlackBerry and so on, although it seems very difficult uh, for companies like, uh, for huge companies to go bank bankrupt, it happens. And as Ernest Hemingway had said in his book, The Sun Also Rises, there was this dialogue where Bill asked, how did you go bankrupt? And Mike replied in two ways, initially, gradually, and then suddenly. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to go Thank your questions. Thank you very much, Otiris, uh, for this excellent navigation. Uh, I think uh, we can start by taking questions. So there is already one question. If you wish to take a look at it, two questions, actually. One. Can you see the Q&A box? Yeah, I think that the first question was uh, asked uh, before I presented the slide, where I said that uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay are dominant in China. I suppose that uh, this person that asked the question is a Chinese person, so uh, most possibly he or she has used uh, these platforms. Uh, I will just add that, uh, you know, in China, no matter if you go to a restaurant, if you go to any place, you will pay through a QR code. Uh, and even if you pay a person on the street, uh, like a beggar, for example, uh, people don't have coins, so the only way to pay is by QR codes. So all these people have their own personal QR code in order to accept payments. And this also applies to India in uh, flea markets and uh, all over the place. So these countries over there, they have bypassed, let's say, the step to go through card organizations. Actually, in India, via uh, regulation and legislation, they make it hard for foreign players to, pro to, to provide services. 
and uh, they have utilized technology in the most efficient way to minimize cash usage and uh, increase digital payments. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm waiting for more questions to come. I have I have a naive question. Mm -hmm. So it seems that we have two wor two worlds here. One is the world of the producer of this kind of digital products. And the other world is the world of consumers who are using these products, these platforms. What do you think is the role of education here for both these two worlds? Uh, I think that uh, in order for, uh, I think that people have to be, let's say, more informed regarding the mechanics and the details of uh, the payment, payment infrastructures. It's very interesting. It's very complicated. And uh, if someone uh, dives in this area, they will see uh, lots of opportunities for innovation and for uh, disruption. Uh, so maybe there could be some, uh, let's say, classes that uh, people could take in order to open their mind towards future uh, payment methods. Thank you. Uh, okay, there is... I have a question here. I, I could mention that. Uh, so I told you about EPI before, the European Payments Initiative. Uh, what happened very recently, it was some four months ago, I think, was uh, European Central Bank, they launched their CBDC initiative in order to start uh, experimenting with the digital euro. They made a consortium and they invited several companies to participate. Uh, one of the companies that were invited was the European Payments Initiative itself in order to provide the mobile application that consumers would use to top up the wallet with CBDC or in general to access their own CBDC accounts and make payments with CBDCs at merchants. And they also onboarded a couple of uh, merchants to participate in this uh, pilot, in this experiment. So what uh, we can see, obviously, is that a digital medium like a smartphone uh, equipped with a digital application in which a digital wallet is installed is, is the best, let's say, platform for CBDCs to work. CBDCs need all kinds of digital media to operate. So all these alternative payment networks are in the best position than anybody else to incorporate CBDC in whatever jurisdiction they operate. I'm sure that uh, what will happen in China, now that uh, the government over there is moving towards CBDC, actually it was one of the very first initiatives all over the world uh, by the Chinese uh, government, we will see WeChat Pay and Alipay uh, open to the, China, to the digital yuan and people will be able to top up their digital wallets with uh, Actually, it's, there's no digital wallet in China. They will be able to access their CBDC funds wherever they are, they are uh, held in order to make payments in the market. Thank you. Um, it seems that uh, we don't have any more questions at the moment. I don't know, Daniele, maybe would you like to raise any thoughts on Sotiri's uh, presentation maybe? Uh, a very, very interesting presentation. I'm fascinated at the speed, the speed of light of these innovations. And I, I used to use Apple Pay myself all the time. So uh, I wasn't aware of some of the... Yeah, I guess it was interesting the, the, the last comment on CBDC and how I, I'm very sympathetic with the view that you know these type of applications can actually be the backbone of, of CBDC implementation at the end. Yeah. Uh, going back to the to the comment on the European initiative, uh, payment initiative. Uh, I'm still curious to see how this uh, CBDC initiative will work out <laughs> because uh, I'm not 100% sure that we get the, co the consensus enough to, 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 to implement the, the whole thing. But yeah, let's see. Let's see how it works out. So thank you, thank you. Very interesting, very interesting presentation. In general, it's hard for Europeans and European banks to, let's say, cooperate. That's what uh, history has <laughs> proven many times. 
And when I saw API, I was very curious how it would how it would evolve, and finally didn't evolve, more or less. Uh, but this, uh, you know, this is a sign that uh, we would we expected. I mean, uh, when you have huge players trying to build innovative stuff and so on, they have to fight with their internal powers that contradict and resist to change. Uh, because if you see, take for example any bank, any commercial bank and uh, think of introducing something like what I described. This goes against two uh, kingdoms, allow me to say, inside the bank, the kingdom of cards and the kingdom of remittances, wire transfers. So the two kings over there, they don't like the idea of um, having another king, potential king, next to them. So they do their best to fight the new guy uh, in order for uh, their services and the products not to be fruitful. This has happened all over Europe. There are some countries with some more, let's say, innovative uh, and disruption-loving uh, management teams and CEOs who manage to take it further. There are other cases like what has happened in uh, Greece, for example, in Romania and other countries where they lag behind uh, there as well. That's what that's why it's difficult for such initiatives to thrive. Will the Alipay replace physical commercial banks? No. Uh, banks will be here forever. Uh, I'm, uh, I love disruption, I love innovation, I'm on the forefront of digital. Uh, and I'm saying I'm saying that banks will be here forever, not because I used to be I used to work for banks in the last uh, 30 years. Banks have a reason to be there, and uh, banks are very, very, very uh, tightly connected to governments. Banks are big to are too big to fail. Uh, governments need them, and uh, they will always be there. Gov uh, banks are trusted by people much more than they will trust any kind of uh, of digital service. So not only Alipay will not replace Chinese banks, but any kind of uh, fintech uh, player will replace uh, a traditional bank. Banks may close. Banks may be acquired by other banks. Banks may merge with other institutions, but some banks will always be there. That's my opinion, at least. Do you think the significant market power of payment companies like Visa and Mastercard have slowed this payment transformation. No, 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 not at all. It's just that what we should, uh, let's say, admit is that these uh, behemoths, they, they still grow. It's incredible because there is so much room for digital transformation of uh, payments that uh, Visa and MasterCard are growing uh, like crazy. Their stock prices are increasing like crazy. But if you see inside the payments, uh, inside the total payments uh, volume, you will see that there is a small uh, volume of digital payments, alternative payments, local payment methods that is rapidly increasing, much more rapidly than cards are increasing. And this is what constitutes a potential threat for uh, the traditional uh, card payment business. Because you know, all those small players, they can easily cooperate among them through APIs, application programming interfaces, so that you can have a, a, somebody that pays with Swiss in Sweden being able to pay, to pay at Blick merchants in Poland and the Blick consumer from Poland being able to pay at a Bizum merchant in Spain and so on and so forth. This is very easy to be implemented, especially in a jurisdiction like Europe, which is, con which is supervised by a single authority, which is ECB and DBA. Uh, that, 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 that's what will happen uh, in the future. And what will also happen in the future is that there will be somebody, I can't, no, nobody can tell who that somebody will be, that will eventually consolidate these alternative payment methods, exactly what has happened with food delivery, with uh, taxis, uh, what Free Now did, Daimler and uh, BM. For example, that's what will happen with payment services uh, eventually. So they will constitute a threat against uh, Visa and Mastercard. Uh, do you support the fintech companies go IPO? Of course, why not? Uh, it depends, of course, on uh, the, the timing. 
as always, because you know, depending on uh, the timing, it might you know be a flop or not. But why not? Okay, and I have somebody working for a central bank that uh, underlines that banks uh, will survive. Of course, I think it's uh, it's 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 a nice proposition by futurists to claim that banks will be extinct, but uh, that will not be the case. Throat in UK. Look, UK is a, a, an extremely interesting market. Yes, uh, we have it in uh, our roadmap, but uh, we are based in uh, Europe right now. We utilize the European regula regulatory framework. We are licensed out of Lithuania. And uh, we we launch in Greece because this is where we live. This is where we know the market, and we have uh, a go-to-market strategy that will allow us to grow to grow rapidly. Uh, we will move to other countries that uh, are, let's say, more or less virgin regarding digital payments, and then we'll see. Let's take it like this. There are other markets all over the world that are very interesting. U.S. is extremely interesting because it's a uh, uh, hugely card based and uh, merchants bear huge cost. So I believe that there is a huge room to grow in the uh, US. We'll see country by country, step by step. Okay, I think uh, we have reached the end of this very interesting uh, event. Uh, Sotiris and Daniele, Daniele and Sotiris, thank you so much for spending your time with us and uh, for offering uh, your very insightful views. Uh, I would also like to thank all the attendees and uh, last but not least, uh, Zafira Salam, who has uh, administered uh, this event in uh, such a professional way. Thank you, Zafira. Thank you, Zafira. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, we would also li all like to thank the School of Economics and Finance for offering this opportunity to you. As I said, the purpose of this event is to stay connected with our alumni and our current students. So feel free to provide us uh, with any feedback. Uh, Zafira will uh, distribute to you a questionnaire to be filled in by you. So your feedback will be very valuable. Uh, feel free also to send us any views you may have on the topic we have just examined, as well as on other future topics yeah. uh, you may be interested in, uh, in attending, as well as any suggestions you may have for the development of activities within the School of Economics and Finance and our MSc programs. I'm sure that Daniele uh, will very much appreciate any, any feedback you may have on the topic of fintech. So once again, thank you so much. Have a nice afternoon or a nice evening, depending on uh, where you reside. And we're looking forward to seeing you soon in one of our future activities. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much, George, Safira. Thank you very much. And the audience. Thank you all. Bye.